Mr. Manager. Good morning, sir. What you got for us today? We have five items. Uh, Kate is going to get up and talk us through the new website design. That will take just a few minutes. Then Fred Gassert is here from Lake Afton to give us an observatory update. We'll do a quick agenda review. Sheena is going to talk to us about success factors for just a bit, and Van will give us some community information. So just a few items, nothing too long, but work to do. Sounds good. Good morning, Kate. Good morning. Okay, so when you go to our website, sedgwickcounty.org, here's our homepage. And for anyone who's interested in finding our meeting minutes, agendas, or videos, it's kind of a lengthy process. You go down to commissioners and then um, commission meetings, click again for view meetings and agendas, and then you click again, and we finally get to the page we're going to. So it's fairly intensive for someone who's used to one click and, and boom, you're there. So what we're changing, um, and this is still a test environment, we will have this modified uh, along with you know the on-base change um, for once it hits commission meetings it will direct you to this new page where it has all the information where you can find the commission meetings broadcast on city channels you can find us on our YouTube link find the agendas online and then here's a list of upcoming meetings and then our archives will be down here so for 2019 we'll have our regular meetings and then once we have everything migrated over, it will say agenda, minutes, and video. So everything will be on one page, one click, easy for both internal and external users. And um, hopefully it's a lot nicer and more <coughs> friendlier. And that's the only presentation or the only talking points I have. Okay, can you scroll up? You also uh, link to, uh, that's the other Bel Air? Yeah, so our meetings are rebroadcast every day at 5 p.m. on Bel Air City Channel 7, rebroadcast in Derby, and then the city of Wichita rebroadcasts as well. Every so, day? Wednesday, the same. Yep. Oh, gosh. Hey, wow. So we walk through one more time, so you have to, I mean, if you're, if you're like, going to the home the shock is back, it's nice to see the TV. So if we're at the home page, like the traditional, <laughs> it would just be, um, it, this would turn into this page. So it's just the one click. Commission meetings. And then, mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. So. One of our uh, IT specialists, she has a three-click rule, and so we're working towards making everything more um, faster and getting rid of some unnecessary clicks. But to, to see the current meeting, you've got to go down to the bottom, and you've got to click on something to get to the current meeting? For Currently, yeah, it's several clicks away. Okay. And then for the new platform that we're going towards, it's scrolling, and then... You would have it here. But if they're going to a meeting page, why wouldn't you make it above the fold instead of having to scroll all the way down? I mean, if that's we can work to. What they're doing. Can we transfer that up? Sure. We'll talk to trans talk to Chantel. Put it anywhere it's needed. Okay. Very good. Anything else, Kate? That's all I have. Well, who all worked on this besides IT? <laughs> it was uh, predominantly IT, and then us in communications. Very good. We'll tell you folks. Good work. Thank you. Fred, thank you, sir. Come on, Fred. Hello. My name is Fred Gassard. I'm uh, chairman of the board of the Lake Afton Public Observatory. Uh, a little background on me: I'm a business owner. I've been an elevator contractor since 1983. Have my own business, and I'm an amateur astronomer. And as an amateur astronomer. Uh, served multiple terms as president of the local astronomy club, the Kansas Astronomical Observers. Uh, I've built my own telescopes. I've done a lot of outreach. I've done a lot of observing. I'm actually a master observer with the uh, with the uh, astronomical league. And uh, as you'll see, when uh, WSU decided to uh, vacate the observatory, uh, we kind of jumped in. So. This is kind of the story of what happened, what we're doing now, and what we look to do in the future. 
So, uh, as you know, the observatory was built in 1980. Uh, it was it was. Uh, paid for by the Sedgwick County, uh, City of Wichita, WSU, and, and well, actually Sedgwick County and WSU, or, uh, City of Wichita paid for it, and WSU and the USD 259 operated it, and that went went that way for a, a number of years. Uh, City of Wichita got out, um, I think after a couple of years, and then after about 10 or 15 years, the school system uh, decided they weren't going to be involved anymore, so it was just WSU operating it along with the along with the county. Um, in 2015, WSU decided uh, they didn't want to do it anymore. They had they had their reasons. Uh, they had a lot of a lot invested in it, and they wanted to use their their funds uh, somewhere else. So uh, they they decided it in August of 2015 to close. So, like I said, the Kansas Astronomical Observers uh, met out there. At that time, I was the president of the club, and uh, we decided we wanted to try to find a way to keep it open or reopen it. And we joined with uh, a group called the Open Wichita, which I just found out yesterday isn't around anymore, but, uh, but they were there long enough to get us going. They helped us with some uh, technical uh, uh, technical things to help set up and and make sure we had what we needed to needed to do so we set up an exploratory team uh, educators volunteers uh, from uh, people from the astronomy club and uh, from the observatory itself and decided we had enough volunteers to uh, to maybe make this work so and we had to, we found out that the observatory was already a 501 c3 um, really simple process to uh, transfer ownership was just to change the names on the paperwork but we had to convince uh, people that we could do it so um, <coughs> the directors at that time were uh, representing each one of the four <coughs> original group the building was owned by is owned by Sedgwick County and at that time the telescope was owned by Wichita State so it was our job to convince Wichita State that we could do good with their telescope and with their program that they had and we had to convince the county that we had the manpower to, to be able to operate it. Then we had to convince the county the WSU was with us and we had to convince WSU that the county was with us. So this process took a little while. <clears throat> I kept saying it was, we were going to know something next Thursday and um, almost a year later uh, we had the transfers completed. Uh, the, the WSU transferred the uh, the telescope to the 501c3, and the new board members were set. And so, at that point, we had uh, we had control of the 501c3. In July of 2016, we got a lease with the county, uh, agreed upon to uh, to take over the operations of the of the observatory, and that's when we got the keys. Uh, keep keep in mind, it's July 6th of 2016. We opened up that Labor Day, so just a little over a month, uh, a little mm -hmm. over a month after that, we opened up and um, made a lot of changes to the to it. The first weekend, uh, we had 625 visitors, uh, which um, kind of kept going with what WSU had had when they closed. We had a lot of lot of interest, but at that point, we had people think that was only three days we were going to be open, so they tried to make sure they were going to come out and not miss it. Um, like I said, we've made a lot of changes, and I'll kind of go through uh, some of them. Uh, in the lobby, there was a mural on the wall of um, an abstract mural of the Orion Nebula. We've painted over that, uh, much to the chagrin of some of our volunteers, but we added a couple of monitors and, and kind of spruced it up. We got a Lake Afton, uh, new Lake Afton logo uh, designed by somebody from Open Wichita and donated to us, and so that, that helped us get, up, get off the ground. We uh, changed the way the lobby is set up um, with a new you know, cashier stand, and, and we've got some more changes we're going to make there. Uh, we do have um, things for sale now: T-shirts, pens, pencils, uh, light keychains, and lights. Exhibit area. Um, one of the things we noticed was that it was too bright. Uh, 
the the white light really affects your night vision so if you come in and then you went back outside you couldn't see to walk if you went into the observing room you couldn't see the tele you couldn't see to get in there to where the telescope was so we put these diffusers over the light fixtures and um, really knocked the light down um, it's only bright because the camera uh, made it made it brighter so um, we changed some of the modified some of the displays um, making them so they didn't take up as much space and a little more portable if we needed to move things to use the room for something else this is a uh, one fun with light we cleaned up some of the existing exhibits uh, Repainting them, re, uh, just making them look a little look a little fresher, um, and made some new programs that, that that operate with those. Some of the things we left left alone. The Starlight Room has uh, um, some exhibits that are pretty good science exhibits, and uh, wasn't any reason to change them, so we left them the way they were. This was our. Uh, original attempt at a computer center and this is the new one um, the uh, we had a do somebody donated the built it and donated it and it's just got four computers in it and we run uh, the kids can there's different games that they can play on and different astronomy programs that they can run we've got virtual reality uh, headsets uh, the three gray things there are um, what do they call it? Uh, the plastic stuff, uh, 3D printing. Uh, one of our one of the local businesses donated those to us. One of them's the moon, and then some samples of a crater and and the front side and the back side of the moon. It's kind of cool to be able to to touch and feel the difference in the topography of the moon. Um, one of our volunteers built both of these um, displays. Uh, one in a million. That the the tub there has one million white pellets in it and one black one and you roll it till you find the black one and kind of gives you the idea of a, of what a million a million of something is so when you're looking at stars when you're looking at galaxies what what does that really mean and then we've got a couple of kiosk displays that have uh, that we have computer programs and stuff on that people can walk up and use telescope room um, one of the things we did, something you probably don't notice, is the, when we got it, the dome would get stuck. It would rotate about a third of the way around, and we had to climb up on a ladder and pull on it while somebody was running it. And it was kind of dangerous, but we got through it. But when we updated it, we added a second motor to the to the uh, to the opposite side of the room and changed the wheels on it. Kind of re-engineered it. And considering I'm not an engineer, it was kind of a, a feat that I'm kind of proud of that we got it to work. So, uh, but we we updated that and that worked. That works really good now. Um, the telescope when we got it was running on DOS. Uh, took the term open box computer to a new level. It was on three shelves of a cabinet and had some uh, high-powered power supplies to run the telescope. We now run it uh, with, with one USB cable from a computer uh, operating with uh, the current, current window structure, and we can do anything we want to with it. We can actually run it from a, from a, from a cell phone if we wanted to. So uh, we've made some, made some major changes. It took $6,000 in donations to do that. Fortunately, we had three people that were willing to cough up that kind of money, and we got it done about four months after we opened up, and that's one of the biggest biggest improvements that we've made. Um, we had a donor, uh, one of our members donated a uh, six-inch Lund uh, uh, apromatic uh, refractor. That's the white tube. Uh, the, the black tube was what they used for a finder scope um, originally. And we can use it for photography program and for wide field wide field viewing. It's a really nice scope. It's ours until we don't need it anymore, and then he wants it back. So, but he needed a place to put it, so we we we're, we're put it on our telescope. Um, telescope controls. Uh, like I said, we were running on DOS. We had one monitor in there, and now we've got a bank of four monitors that show what the telescope's doing, what the telescope's looking at, and we can actually project pictures of whatever we are looking at 
not only on th that set of monitors, but on two other two other monitors in the building. So, uh, lets people know what's what's going on in the room. Built an activity table. These activities change uh, as we as we progress. We we've, we've got a lot of different things we can do with it. Uh, the one right there in the front, the black one, is a uh, actually a black hole. You put a weight in the middle of it, and then you spin the marble around, and it kind of gives you the idea of what a black hole actually is doing. But those activities we change, and we have the ability to do a lot of different things with that. Um, and again, that was uh, built with donate with donated uh, money. Uh, Science Education Center, uh, in lieu of uh, gi us giving them advertising, gave us uh, four new binoculars, and we updated our uh, binocular box that's outside. Uh, it's allow you to look at the night sky with the binoculars. Every time you come out, they're always there. Um, and then Celestron donated four new 60 millimeter refractors that we use on our um, uh, on our mounts outside and they can use they can look at the sky look at the moon or they can look at uh, we've got an artificial sky set up out there that they can use so it gives them the idea how to how telescope works and how to use a telescope so um, yeah. next step is we need we need ideas from everybody and we we get those all the time so if anybody thinks they want would like to see us do something uh, they can sure let us know some of the ideas we have. Uh, take it back. I'm going to go back and uh, show you the um, how we're doing. This is a sample of 2018. Um, we we're open we're open Friday and Saturday night every Friday and Saturday night for the public, and then we also have uh, events during the week. 82% um, of our income comes on Friday uh, in 2018 came on a Friday or Saturday night. Uh, Astrofest was a special event that we have we had last year and we're going to have this year August 10th uh, made up 15 percent of our of our of our income and then uh, special events the events during the week uh, made up about three percent of our income and that's that's a, we're, we're getting a little higher percentage on that now so um, by category, uh, we get about 80% of our money comes from just people walking through the door. 11% uh, uh, comes from merchandise sales, and we sell about 8% on memberships. And then we do get donations out there. We've got a donation box. Uh, we also get donations direct. We get them on the website. We get them off of uh, Facebook. So uh, the donations are um, uh, quite a bit more than that. Um, Attendance, attendance by event. Um, again, most of our people come in on Friday and Saturday night. Um, we have uh, seven percent on special events Monday through Monday th or Sunday through uh, Thursday, and then Astrofest made up about seventeen percent of our of our attendance. Uh, people that come out, uh, sixty-five percent of them are adults. Uh, Twenty-eight percent. Our school-age kids, uh, seniors make up four percent, and then the the free children make up three percent. So, when people come out; they can bring their bring all of them and and um, and enjoy the enjoy the, the facility. On the expense side, um, we uh, we spend uh, thirty-seven percent on on office, twenty percent on on exhibits. About 16% on merchandise, and of course that's an ongoing an ongoing thing. Uh, Astrofest made up about 10% of our of our expenses. Um, we had some expenses on the building that we weren't anticipating. We had to replace a blower motor, and and so our ex building expenses were a little higher than expected at 10%. And then we have some other expenses that make up about 7%. Upcoming events. Um, July 20th, we're going to celebrate the Apollo 11 uh, moon landing, and of course, there's a, quite a few um, few moon landings after that that we're going to take care of. Uh, August 10th is Astrofest number two. It runs from four to midnight. Uh, we'll have outside displays, uh, activities for everybody to do, activities inside the building. We'll have solar viewing during the day and look at the moon and Jupiter and Saturn at night, and and have a photo contest or photo. Opportunity uh, with the telescopes, as well as uh, the um, 
Star Wars uh, reenactors are going to be out there again this year. So that, that was a big, big hit last year. Um, some of the new projects we've got, we need to put some electrical outlets in the, in the display area. It'd be nice if I could find an electrician that would like to do some work for nothing. Um, um, I know uh, I've been told I don't have to necessarily pull permits, but uh, I need to make sure it's right. So that's one that's one thing I need to tell in the display area. We're going to re-roof the shed. Uh, we get, I think we can get the shingles for nothing. Uh, we had a contractor that offered to do it for nothing, and his offer was eighteen hundred dollars. And I didn't really understand the nothing part there, but. Um, and we want to repaint the shed, and they wanted to recite it for for free, thirty five hundred or thirty eight hundred. Again, I didn't understand the free part where that all worked out, but I was talking, uh, and I think the county's got some paint that we can get for free, and I've got volunteers lined up to, so hopefully we'll have that have that all done before the before the August tenth uh, event, maybe even before the July twentieth event. So we're going to get on that. Wanted to add some red lighting to the LAPO sign on the outside. We did clean up the outside. You guys came out and removed a tree, some trees for us from the front of the building. Uh, cleaned it up pretty good, and uh, we need to. We just want to put some some red light on that sign so it shows up a little better. That's going to cost about a thousand dollars for us to do that. Uh, we've got the money. I just need to get the electrician and get get things going on that. Um, then I've got a folding fence we're going to put on the northwest corner of the of the facility. Um, it's something I'm donating. It's uh, it's actually trash from a job that I did, but it's good uh, material. And we're going to make a metal frame that folds out this way. It'll it'll store up against the building and come out, and it'll have a tarp on it. And basically, it'll block the lights when the cars come in off of MacArthur Road. They shine out on our observing pad real bad. So this will block that block that light we can put it out whenever we need it when the when they need to mow or whatever it's going to be it's going to be tucked out of the way and it'll, and it'll look nice so um, and then we need to clean the shed out and get rid of some of the trash that's in there we've got some display uh, material that we could probably sell we just need to we need to get on we need to get on that as well we've got a memorial donation in the works uh, the Robert Larson estate uh, he he said instead of giving flowers, he said, I want you to give to Lake Afton. So right now that stands at $1,440, and we're going to, uh, uh, if, you, if you've ever been out to the observatory, when you go from the main exhibit area to the telescope room, there's a little area we call the light trap. And the idea is when you go in there, you get acclimated, uh, dark act acclimated. So when you go in, you can use the scope, and you can actually see what you need to see. Well, right now they're using uh, transparency uh, photographs that are very expensive to duplicate and very difficult to, to take care of. Uh, it takes about uh, two and a half hours to change out the display if we want to. So what we're going to do is we're going to put we're going to replace those with four uh, TV monitors and uh, program them with a new computer so that we can. Uh, display the pictures or display whatever we want to display. We've got uh, Newman uh, University has got some some people there that are going to they're going to help us with the programming part of it, and we're hoping to get that we're hoping to get that uh, off and running here in the next uh, the next couple of months. We've got a grant request uh, we've put in to Spirit Aero Systems for some new computers. Uh, the computers at our computer station were donated. They're they were okay when we put them in, but they're, we need the monitors are deteriorating, and we've got one computer that's not not playing like it's supposed to. And we need we've decided we've we've got the concept down. We know what we want to do with it. Now let's do it. If we're going to do it, we might as well do it the right way. So we're looking to do that. We'll repurpose a couple of the old computers, one to run the main monitor in the observing uh, the exhibit area, and then one just to be an office computer. Uh, the one we've got in the office now is run on uh, Windows XP. Uh, it makes it kind of hard to do stuff. Uh, we've upgraded our membership card uh, making so we can make them in-house. If you come in and buy a membership, you'll get it before you leave, whereas before it might take it might take a month or two for us to get it to you. 
Uh, we're updating our, our square system that we use to include all of the inventory and making it so that the, the accounting uh, is a lot easier to, to, to handle. Uh, when 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 you guys come out, we go through the process. We know how many we'll know how many people come. We know what we've done, what we've sold. If we need to buy more shirts, we know what we know what shirts to buy. So uh, that's all stuff that's in the in the current plans. Uh, on that one, we found out I donated a, a, a uh, iPad, and my iPad is one decimal point off of being one that will work with a chip reader. So we're going to probably have to buy us a buy us a new iPad to to make that work. So. The things you learn when you when you're working with stuff that you're not familiar with. Um, one other thing, if you're a, if you're a computer geek, um, we're working on a, an API. Uh, it's a data source where you can get information. Um, I don't understand how it all works, but basically, uh, some websites. If you see a website that has like a weather. Uh, a weather app on it it's they're they're going somewhere else to get that and that's we're hoping that people will come to us to get their information right now we have uh, uh, what you see up there you know what's up and what moon info and the sun and whatnot um, we're working on developing developing that and uh, hopefully at some point we'll be able to um, um, sell it like they do, like, like a lot of the other apps do, and it's a hopefully it'll become a fundraiser for the for the observatory as well. That's pretty much it. Um, invite everybody to come out. Uh, we do give county employees a discount of one dollar if you do come out. So um, the um, um, we'd like to see you come out. So any questions? Questions. Just more of a comment. Just want to say thank you for all you do there. Uh, this was, uh, I think, very. You know, the community wanted to keep it in 2016. It was threatened to go away, and and uh, somehow uh, partnerships uh, and a lot of in involvement by a lot of volunteers it endured. And I'm so thankful that it's there. And I think in terms of quality of life, I am very happy that it, uh, that this is still a thing for this community. And Looks to me like your business model works. Um, your your numbers look like there's not a lot of extra money there, but it looks like it uh, it looks like it's, it's a, it is sustainable. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, as far as I can tell, it looks like it'll be here for a long time, and I'm I'm very happy about that. So thank you for all you do. Thank you. Any other questions? I want to thank you and uh, Harold and all the rest of the board for what you do out there to keep that running. Okay. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, uh, I'm on the board now, so I right. do attend your meetings. Uh, I come back and, and tell Tim what you all need and see if we can help got out. Them, got that tree down in two days, so it was... Uh, <laughs> so, very good. Okay. Well, thanks for the update. We appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, we'll go take a quick look at the May 8th agenda. You should have one in front of you. Um, Kate, do we have anything at the beginning of the meeting that you know of at this time? <coughs> we will talk about um, Teen Pregnancy Month and Mental Health Awareness Month. There's three proclamations following that. National Bike Month, uh, the fact that we are a census partner for the 2020 Census and its Corrections Officer Week, which all will be notated by proclamation. Uh, items G through K are all appointments or resignations in individual commission districts. And then uh, new business item L, uh, Denise Sherman will come in and talk about TCAM and give us an update on uh, operations and uh, budget and some other items. Item M will be pulled. That is actually going to be a grant uh, that we can approve at manager level, so that will not be on the agenda for the May 8th meeting. Um, item N is a uh, uh, grant for the Regional Forensics Science Center, which Dr. Stedman will be here to discuss. Um, item O is a property tax relief case that I think uh, Justin has walked the halls on and talked with you about already. Um, and then items P, Q, and S are building code adoptions. Uh, P is the water well code, uh, Q is the uh, IBC, and S is the IEBC. And in the middle of that, we sandwiched Rick Durham with the CAFA report. I think we'll probably make that where Chris Labram can just keep the podium and we'll exchange R and S. 
um, and then uh, Board of Bids and Contracts. And on consent is pretty much public works and planning uh, items, easements and plats and uh, et cetera. Item X is a, a resolution amending a few county policies, which um, you will get a draft of. And I think, Sheena, will we walk the halls on that? Yeah, we'll see between now and next Wednesday and talk to you about the policy chair. Other than that, that's it for next Wednesday. There is a fire agenda, but it's just minutes approval. Um, Any questions? Any questions? Sheena, can you tell us about um, success factors? Yes. Um, we did go live yesterday at the meeting. Um, there has been some feedback that I have heard what's going on with the department. That site is still live, and we still have some jobs posted there. They are either closing, some of them closed last night at midnight, or they're closing today. And the reason that those are still open is we have applicants that have applied for those jobs. So as opposed to closing the job out and reopening them on success factors and making them apply again, we'll let that job opening run its cycle on HRE partners and close them out and review the candidates there. Um, there are some continuous openings on HRE partners, and we will close those out and open them on success factors, such as potentially that we get a big degree of higher turnover for it. Um, but we are actively posting on success factors now. They are going live. I checked it last night. We have two postings on there that are, are being sent out. So it, it is a, there are two different systems. So we did not, we're not able to pick up information on an HRE partner and set all that into success factors. With success factors that is determined by the department, so they have to initiate that job opening and it has to go through the process of approval before it is posted. Very good. Questions? Well, good. Tom mentioned uh, to me this morning that you have to re input everything. Uh, as I went on the website yesterday to see what kind of openings we had, and the uh, appraiser office has an opening, and it didn't matter where you click, you got the appraiser office opening, but yeah. that was the only one I was finding. We're really pushing that position. There will be more. We're going to lose our applicant pool that is already in HRE partners. Any other questions? Good. All right. I forgot to mention on your fire agenda next week, I didn't mean to diss him, but uh, Chief Williams' contract approval is on that too, or his uh, his agreement. So I, that is the one item that you'll have to approve that uh, is germane. So the rest of it, the rest of it is perfunctory. Chief is not. So. Well, that's pretty important. Yeah. Um, <coughs> any questions on success factors? Um, don't see any. Uh, Van? Okay. Uh, uh, three things. Um, the county will have a uh, booth at two popular weekend events. Um, Cinco de Mayo on Saturday and uh, Open Streets ICT on Sunday. We'll have 911 and corrections at Cinco de Mayo and County Communications will be at Open Streets ICT. Um, we'll have uh, we'll pass out information, giveaways, and promote the, uh, the jobs through uh, career site. Um, also, pleased to announce we finally have a date for the Law Enforcement Training Center and Dedication. That's going to be June 13th at 3.30, so mark your calendars, um, and we'll provide remarks for people who are speaking. And I should point out that Kate Flavin forgot to mention one thing. Today is her birthday. Uh, <laughs> okay. 21, finally. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Beer, legal. Right, right. <laughs> we've got donuts in the office if y'all want to come by and visit. Good. What else you have, Mr. That's, Manning? I believe all we have. Very good. Commissioners, what do you have this morning? I just have uh, two things, then, if none of the commissioners have anything. Uh, first of all, uh, I think several of us are going to learn to be firemen for the day on Saturday. Uh, so hopefully I, they uh, ask for all kinds of medical information. I'm hoping they keep me alive uh, during the event. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know. Commissioner Cruz, are you going to go do that Saturday morning? I am. Very good. Uh, Commissioner O'Donnell, I think you're. I'm doing the Republican one. Oh, you're yeah. doing that? Okay. Very good. I anyway, I guess just Commissioner Cruz and I are going to learn to be firemen Saturday morning. So if anyone wants to come out and, and uh, especially EMS, they're certainly invited out there. Anyway, that's one thing coming up. 
uh, the other thing I want to talk about, uh, where the t I can speak with all the commissioners at one time, uh, is uh, last week uh, I had a meeting uh, on a EMCU, the Exploited Missing Childs uh, Unit. <coughs> and so one of the things that I brought up, <coughs> excuse me, during that meeting was something that I talked about last time that we had a uh, staff meeting, and that's uh, that we're having. Uh, a number of children that are being killed by people that should be taking care of them instead of, uh, of uh, injuring them. And I, I wanted to know what we could do here. And the nice thing about it, in that room we had the local head of the DCF office here, we had a representative from the sheriff's office, uh, we had a representative from the police department, uh, from the DA was there. And uh, one thing that I learned uh, during that meeting is that DCF has a couple different databases, one they call KIDS and one they call KIPS. Uh, but evidently, uh, that KIPS database is the one that they mentioned, uh, uh, is if we could tap into that and get one piece of information out of that, and all we need is one piece of information, and that's whether or not that there's been contact either at that office or with the, the name of the individual uh, that we could provide to 911 so that uh, when 911 sends out uh, a call uh, to uh, dispatch a police officer or uh, the sheriff's officer uh, to a location, uh, if we could give them some kind of a signal that says that there was something happening at that in the past, that DCF had had contact at that address or DCF has had contact with that name of that individual, then uh, the officers that uh, uh, appear at the scene can say, hey, can we check on the welfare of the children that are at that unit? Uh, now, it's going to require something from the state to be able to do that uh, because uh, uh, they, we need to interface our computer-aided uh, dispatch information with this other system to get just one piece of information. We don't need everything that's in their database. We just need to know one thing. Was there something going on there that we need to check on the welfare of the, of the child? Case or something. Yeah. Your case or so if, if you looked at the news recently, there was numerous 911 calls to the location of the last death. Uh, and luckily, on that last, well, it, probably not luckily, on that last day when we found uh, the one child dead, if the officers had not have asked to play eyes on the children, uh, first of all, they wouldn't have found that one was dead. Second of all, they would not have been able to save the second child. That second child is only alive because the officers took the initiative to say, can we see uh, the children? Uh, so that's what we need, is we need to have our officers have the ability to say that. Can we see the children? Uh, so what my suggestion is, and, I, and I'm uh, doing this in an open meeting so that we can discuss it, uh, is I'd like to send a letter to the governor and possibly the leadership in the House and the Senate and say, what can you do to get DCF to work with our 911 system so that we can have a <coughs> signal of some sort sent out uh, so that we can identify that there may be a problem uh, possibly or just check on the child's welfare. So I guess I need uh, the other commissioners, I know this isn't a formal meeting, but all I'm asking for is a letter. Uh, do you have any objection to us as a commission sending out a letter to the governor and the leadership of, of the House and Senate saying we need some coordination with DCF to get something in place? We need to. Any problem with that at all? Well, I'm kind of familiar with some of these agencies, government agencies, are very protective of their data, especially the you know, uh, personnel matters. Right. So I think we need to word it something that uh, maybe have IT help us. But really, I think what we want to have is a query. We don't really, really <coughs> have access into their system. No, so we don't. We want to be able to query to, to dip it, just yes or no. But we ought to get the language yeah, we can help that. so we make it as... as just a query. Your data is protected. We don't. We don't want anything. You know, all of the you know, PII information and all that stuff is still. It's that. It's their stuff because they're going to be very protective of their. Well, I agree. Uh, and not. They're not going to be all up for it unless we make it sound as neutral and as minimal and as. 
That's why I was saying we only need one piece of information. Yeah. Was there something happening with that name or that address? Okay. Yes. We don't want anything else. We don't want to compromise their database. We don't want any other access. And it may need to be a two-way street because if the officers see something that needs reported back to DCF, I don't. We may need uh, some kind of interface going back to make sure that uh, we say that everything is good or there are problems uh, there. So. If, if there's no objections, uh, I'll have uh, asked the manager to start uh, working with the folks to get a letter put together for us so that we can sign out. I, I have no objections to the to the idea. I, I, I guess I'm looking at the issue and say, we ought, do we really understand exactly where the barrier is? Is it DCF that's, that's that has the information that we need? That's the, that's the, the part that we don't have access to. Uh, the, obviously, our judicial system does feed information into DCF. They're very closely connected. And I don't know. I don't know. I'm not I'm personally aware of exactly where, you know, who has access to what information right now, where the barrier is. I guess I'd like to say, it'd be nice to maybe talk to some of the folks within the county to find out if we really understand exactly where the barrier is as a starting point, so we know what we're asking for. I mean, I, I don't want to approach the state with a with a request if if our if our request doesn't make sense to them. So I guess I'd like to understand it deeply as to where is the barrier. That's causing this to happen at this point. Well, I'm not. No, I don't know that it's a barrier. It's just that right now we're not transferring information that may be needed by that officer when they arrive. Uh, so I, I don't know if I'd call it a barrier. Uh, when I talked to the local uh, head of the DCF here. Uh, he said there are two systems, one's called KIDS and one's called KIPS, K-I-D-S and K-I-P-S. He said the KIDS system really isn't very up to date, uh, so there were some problems there. The KIPP system, he indicated, may have the information that we need, and uh, he didn't see that uh, that was a barrier uh, other than we would have to work through the state in order to be able to get access to the little portion of the data and make sure that there's some kind of firewall uh, so that we only get the piece of information that we need. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm certainly supportive of, of writing the letter. I just, just want to make sure that when we approach the state, it's, it comes from a position of knowledge that we understand exactly right. what we're really asking for, that's all. Very good. I'm supportive of it too. I just want to bring up though, you know, when, and Jim, maybe you have, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but in the CJCC <coughs> meeting last week, you know, they talked about that drugs is, is really an issue. And I know this case in particular, meth was involved. And so I wonder, you know, the correlation between using drugs and is, I mean, could that have been prevented? If this woman, if these people would have been off drugs, would they have been better parents? I don't know. But I think we do have to talk about our drug addiction problem, our recidivism rate in our jails. I mean, that to me, the DA last week was like, it was, it's all about drugs. It's all about people not being able to get the help that they need. And we have all these issues related to addiction. And so I, I love the fact that you thought of this. I love that we, we would send something to our state to talk about this, but I think we have to, we have to, in addition to this letter, talk about what is best for our mental health problem here. We've talked about a mental health facility, but is an addiction treatment center something that maybe is, is more feasible? Or, you know, I, I don't know what it is, but are we tackling the real issues? And to me, it was all about drugs and addiction. So that's something yeah. that I would like to discuss in addition to what we're talking about now. I, I do remember when I was there, we had some legislation, and I don't know exactly how it turned out, but I'm sure someone in the room probably does know. But there was a while there where when the, when the police officer came across someone who in, in the community they thought was potentially had, had a history of mental illness, and they, maybe they weren't personally aware of it, but they suspected maybe this was a, a chronic issue that they were able to uh, there was information in the 911 system that would let them know that we've had this person in the system before. In other words, a little bit of history was available at the 911 system that would allow that police officer to take them for treatment rather than to the jail. It was some front-end inf in front in front information. It had to be, uh, I think HIPAA was an issue. But anyway, we did pass legislation, I, I believe, that allowed some type of uh, collection of data and transmittal of information from 911 back to the LEO so that he would know um, some of the history of this person. This reminds me of that. So I think the, the issue is between the drug addiction, uh, drug abuse issues, and the mental health. If uh, there's children involved in some of those cases, that's what I think you're asking for, is, is how does that connect to the other history you already have 
that may be related to mental health and, and substance abuse that uh, may impact those children and the, and the welfare of those children. Um, I think it's all it's all intermingled, and it's hard to put your finger on exactly what you know where is the information we need. But I think all of it's relevant. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree with Commissioner Cruz. Uh, uh, if you look at our legislative agenda this year, the number one item on our legislative agenda was behavioral health, and, and that takes in the gamut between mental health issues, uh, drug and alcohol abuse, homelessness, and so forth. So, uh, we didn't get very far this year on our number one uh, item on our legislative agenda. Uh, hopefully, uh, our legislature next year can take a look at it uh, and to see what kind of concerns that we really do have here. This is, this is a huge county. Uh, we have a huge amount of our leadership uh, and the legislature is from this area. So uh, I'm hoping that we can get the word across to them next year that we need to take care of something on behavioral health. <clears throat> Just one comment. We, law enforcement has the ability to flag addresses and people with certain codes. We do it for gang members, we do it for suicidals, we do it for mentals. Uh, this is now, the, the thing that's different about what you're suggesting here is we've, we flag that all of this historical categories based on actual events. In other words, we have contact with suicidal people, so then that address becomes flagged as signal four in the system. Um, the gang flagging has to, goes through a series of steps and a person is given that status, not lightly, but law enforcement, the burden is on them to show categories of why they are gang members. This is different though because you want proactively an address or people flagged with a DCF connotation that in other words they're a customer or client of DCF which would be a little bit different for this strategy than what we how we code or signal other categories of people so um, I don't know if there's roadblocks as much as there are just things we'll have to work through from the state side from a Laura side with CAD and then figuring how to get that transmitted out to, to the police officers that need it in our hands so we'll we'll craft the letter with those kinds of outlines in mind and get it sent or have you sign it, sign it. Yeah. Yeah. that's encouraging to know that there's already various there is a system. flags yeah. that appear for other things you think we just Add one more, add one more flag, so to speak. Good. Yeah, and during the EMCU meeting, uh, I learned about these flags. Uh, the sheriff's office and the police department are the ones that. Uh, uh, this is not an original idea from David Dennis. Trust me. I, it is original on DCF. There were some have, very smart there. people in the room that worked at stuff every day that uh, said there are flags in place and maybe we can interface. I mean, we uh, Laura has the capacity now. We, if we make a call at an address and it comes to the officer's attention that they are DCF clients. We can enter that in and flag that. You're talking about a system, though, that would proactively grab that piece of data from the state so that we don't have to wait for historicals. And people change addresses all the time, and it's where, um, you know, it, it sometimes it's better to have it flagged with the person than it is with the address. So we'll, we'll craft the letter and get the ball rolling. Are officers trained to ask if there are children in the home? Not on a, I mean, on a family, it depends on the type of call, but you would clearly flag. I mean, if I'm an officer going to a family disturbance, for example, I'm going to ask that question. Um, and it depends on the type of call, but not routinely. No, not on burglary reports or uh, type of criminal reports. They're, if it's, Maybe they should. Maybe and they, they do. If you walk required. into a house and it's in disarray and, and messy and, and you see evidence of kids, a lot of times the officers will ask to see get their eyes on the kids, which is probably what happened down in this case. It was just in such a disarray that a normal, reasonable person would say, let me see your kids. So, sorry. Okay. All right. Anything else from the commissioners? Anything from staff? Oh. Mr. Spears. Show the video that Tony shot uh, overhead. I think so. Good. He did a great job on that. Yeah. All right. What's done with the tires? Uh, the vendor takes them and he shreds them up and uh, gets the uh, steel, steel melts out of them and then they try to recycle the rubber from different things, like playgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also use it for asphalt. You can melt it. There's certain, certain companies 
Thank you. 